Oh, we're Hello, recording. welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is uh, Atoma Eji. I'm uh, so excited you joined us today. We have some uh, very special guests. Um, and if you guys can actually just raise your hand as I just uh, call your name out and you can introduce yourself as we kind of go through. But we have uh, Dave uh, Mulutunak, um, who's, yep. And then we have uh, Daniel, pronounce your name, I'm sorry. Daniel uh, Dicochea. Dicochea, okay. So uh, Dave is the uh, CEO of Popo Wide, and uh, Daniel is uh, the director, I believe it is, of Popo Wide in Tucson, Arizona. So I think a lot of us are, you know, a lot of us are probably homebound or, you know, going through a lot right now. And we wanted to have this episode specially to really encourage us and show us different ways we can get involved uh, with trying to make a difference in our communities. This is what disciples are all about. We don't wanna just sit home and kind of watch the world go by. We wanna know what we can do. So uh, if you like this episode, definitely uh, please click like and subscribe so it can be shared with others. But uh, right now we're gonna go ahead and start with uh, Mr. Dave. So if you could maybe just uh, you know, introduce yourself a little bit, Dave, kind of share your history a little bit. I know you got some very uh, and very interesting history. If you can share about that and then we'll kind of go from there. Sure, thanks, Atoma. Um, again, my name is Dave Malutnock. Uh, I've been um, a Christian for 44 years. Uh, and this year I'm celebrating my 40th wedding anniversary. So a lot of 40s in there. Um, but uh, I started, um, I became a Christian in college. And um, when I graduated in, in uh, uh, accounting and economics, uh, started working for a corporation, got my MBA, and, um, and then was, uh, you know, pretty happy for a while, but I just felt like life was not as rewarding, certainly my Christian life was, but my professional life, and um, had the opportunity to, in 1993 to um, be part of Hope for Children, the uh, International Adoption Agency, domestic and international, and that was just a, a life changer for me. Uh, I enjoyed it so much. It was extremely heartbreaking, but extremely rewarding. And um, then I, uh, after three years, uh, Bob and Pat Gimple asked me to be CFO of Hope Worldwide. Did that, and then um, I became president of the National Council for Adoption in Washington, D.C., um, followed by uh, some time as a consultant in Boston, and then uh, spent 10 years as a senior level person for Habitat for Humanity International. Uh, and then uh, most recently, I've been with Hope, uh, back again with Hope for two years. So that's kind of a rundown of my story. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, so can you tell us what Hope Worldwide is for those that may not know? Uh, maybe just how it got started, you know, how it's progressed and kind of where it's at right now. Sure. Hope Worldwide was started in 1991. Uh, it was a, an organization that was attached to the International Churches of Christ. Um, there was, uh, as, as more and more missionaries started going out around the world uh, from the U.S., uh, it became very clear that there is a poverty issue. There's an issue with uh, so many different people and cultures that are marginalized. Uh, and that we need to do something about it. And so Hope Worldwide was formed and uh, Bob and Pat Gimple were asked to lead that. Um, and then um, at the same time, the Hope for Children uh, was just being started. And so Hope for Children kind of sat as, as the largest um, subsidiary of Hope Worldwide. Uh, Hope Worldwide grew from a budget of uh, maybe half a million dollars to uh, a budget of close to 20, 25 million. And that's just with um, the Hope Worldwide uh, Limited. Then we have sprung off and there are Hope Worldwide organizations around the world. We're in about 40 different countries and, um, uh, and they each are, are run by their own board of directors, but we, we work very closely together, um, all the different hopes around the world. 
and um, you know do do things from orphanages to hospitals to um, uh, helping the elderly, um, feeding the poor. Um, our but what we've you know real, realized that our strength uh, are twofold. One, we have the best volunteers in the world. And mm -hmm. I've been with a lot of different uh, large um, nonprofits. And I have never seen a nonprofit that has the kind of volunteers we have. And secondly, uh, we have boots on the ground in anywhere there's a church. Uh, and later, as we talk about COVID-19 and what Hope has done, um, you know, I can get into that. but. We, we are uh, an organization that wants to use our volunteers uh, since we are attached to um, the International Churches of Christ. Um, if our members need help, uh, whether it's a disaster or COVID-19 or whatever, we want to we want to help them. But uh, also, you know, we we don't distinguish between religion or culture or anything. Uh, where we're needed and where we have the resources, we try to help out. That's awesome. So um, right now, obviously, the global pandemic, uh, COVID-19 has ravaged the world. I mean, I don't think in, a, in our lifetimes there's gonna be anything like this that we'll be looking back at. It's just, it's impacted every area. So I just wanted to know, you know, what Hope Worldwide has done um, in, as far as the response or programs they've set up and then I guess second to that, as you are kind of address, I guess addressing that is anything that Hopeful Wide has done in reference to some of the racial uh, uh, matters, just trying to have racial harmony and these kinds of things. If you can maybe talk about that briefly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, first with the COVID-19, uh, you know, as um, Daniel was talking a little earlier, um, we use volunteers to to um, offer services to people. But with COVID-19, it, it really hurt Hope Worldwide as well because we couldn't deliver the kind of services we normally do because everybody's quarantined and everybody's kept in. Um, what we started hearing were from a number of our different churches um, around the world that um, members of the churches Christians were starting to starve uh, because they couldn't get out. And the majority of the world really are day laborers, um, are maybe weekly laborers where, uh, you know, and, and we call this the majority of world because this is where the majority of the people live. Uh, the U.S. is a minority world country. But in the majority world, uh, you know, there's, there's not... <clears throat> the refrigerators and can't store food and and even most people's salaries they're they're living day to day or week to week and if they can't work then they can't eat and most countries don't have the kind of social social systems that would provide food and would provide other things and um and so many of our churches they were just there any benevolence funds they had were just dried up because there was such a need and um uh and so after we started talking to a number of folks and what we thought is that again we could use what what hope worldwide one of our strengths which is boots on the ground and so we started we figured what we could do is collect money and then we can send that money based on some kind of application system around the world and 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 help buy food for members of the church and their families and then their communities that are starving and um we started a, a covid 19 relief project okay. and um in about two months uh raised a little over two million dollars Wow. Um, yeah, I think I saw about that. that was when the Dean Templer had posted some stuff. Yeah, and so far um, we have sent about seven hundred thousand dollars in in uh, um, to to either churches or hope entities 
um, that had bought food, had bought medical supplies um, for members of our churches and for um, uh, their families and, and their neighbors. Uh, we have sent money to over 60 countries and over 230 individual churches or hope entities. And as a, as a person coming from a, um, a very, very, one of the largest nonprofits uh, in the world, um, that, is, that is not easy to do, even with one of the largest nonprofits. But because of our strength that we have boots on the ground everywhere and people that we can trust, uh, we've been able to disseminate food to help about 40,000 people eat wow. so far. And, um, and to, you know, it, we're, we're so grateful for, for the churches and for the members of the churches and for friends and even some corporate donations uh, that have built up over $2 million. Um, and uh, we, we have a team of people that have uh, uh, really have a, an application process down and they look at uh, economic factors in the country. They look at how far the dollar goes in the different countries where we're sending money. It's a pretty sophisticated process. Uh, what we want to do is make sure that everybody gets a fair amount. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want any disciple to go to bed hungry tonight. And um, we don't want there to be haves and have nots where some people just can't get any funding, but others can't. We, we want to try to make it as equal as possible. And um, we also, uh, something that's super exciting, maybe Nadine mentioned, um, but we wanted to get young people involved, uh, college age and high school age. So a group of them got on a Zoom call and, um, and we told them, listen, here's the problem, here's the issue, um, you're passionate, you're smart, you know social media. What can you do to raise money? And there's two things that they did primarily. They, they put together on their own uh, a concert for hope um, that raised about $130,000 mm -hmm. just from high school and campus kids. Wow. And then there was another program they put together called Bald for Bucks. Yeah, I heard about that. Um, Steve Johnson. A lot of people, <laughs> you know, shave their heads and a certain <laughs> amount of money that was raised. And, yeah. and again, about $60,000 for COVID was raised just from that. That's awesome. So, you know, um, whether you're a teen or whether you're a young campus student, um, man, there's a lot you could do to help the world. That's awesome. That is so awesome. Um, so I know right now one of the things that I think is perhaps something we should continue to focus on is just getting biblical uh, guidance as far as how we think about injustice. So I know before our call you mentioned that you had studied out injustice uh, on your own. Can you share about some of the things that you learned and that, that might help us in our own Bible study? Sure. The there's, there's two terms for justice in, in Hebrew. Uh, the primary one is a mishpat. And in the Greek, the terms for justice in the Old Testament in Hebrew are much deeper than how Greek, would, Greek language would define justice. So the justice words and the meaning of justice in the New Testament is not near as powerful as the Hebrew words. And the Hebrew word for justice uh, is mishpat, and another term for justice is sadeka. Um, the New Testament oftentimes references sadeka as righteousness. And, and so we tend sometimes to treat that as our personal righteousness. Are, are we you know, are we not sinning? And if we're not, then, okay, we're being righteous. In the Old Testament, righteousness and justice were the same thing. If, if you're not providing justice, 
then you're not righteous. Wow. And it's not a matter of personal purity. Of course, that's important, very important. Huh. But if you look at the really terms for justice in the Hebrew, it's, 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 it's both righteousness and justice. And both of those together form uh, um, what uh, God is calling, was call, calling all the Hebrews for, and, and it's the same with us today. Um, you know, there's, when you look at the, uh, when the uh, Hebrews were in um, Egypt for so many years as slaves, and then God called them out of Egypt, and he, he as they were in the, in the desert, God was starting a new nation. And so much of starting the new nation, the words mishpat and the words sedeka were used, meaning you are to be a nation that is just. You're to be a nation that is providing justice to each other. And uh, even a, a story that um, happened the first, um, uh, the first group, and uh, I should have looked this up, the first people that attacked the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert. Uh, this, this particular tribe or group of people, they would wait till a caravan passed, and then they would attack from behind because your weakest people, the people that are marginalized are generally going to be the ones behind. And um, after this first attack attempt, then in something called the Mishnah, which is sort of the verbal, uh, uh, the verbal history of the Jews, um, they were told that from now on, those that are marginalized, those that are weak, those you know, aliens and orphans and widows and the sick and the lame, they are to be in the middle of your group with the strength protecting them. And that that is the measure of a strong society. When people are treated just and when the stronger in society are protecting those that might be treated unjustly. Um, so there's so much power in what God wanted to see in the, um, uh, when he started his nation. And of course, you know, it, it kind of fell apart because people didn't follow God. But then even in the New Testament, um, you know, you think of the, the you, you had Jews, you had Gentiles in the same church, you had um, Roman citizens and non-Roman citizens. And those non-Roman citizens could be slaves. They could be um, just, you know, a certain caste of society. Um, and they definitely weren't treated as equal as the Roman citizens. But you had this, this church of Jew and Gentile, Roman citizen, non-Roman citizen, um, all walks of life working together and you know there were problems in the church mm -hmm. but when when the apostles and and later church fathers when they saw problems okay we got to fix it mm -hmm. and i think you know that's what we really need to do is yes there is a there is a problem with you know our white brothers and sisters not understanding the challenges and understanding the injustice that our brothers and sisters of color are have experienced and, and continue to experience. So those white brothers and sisters need to, um, you know, go arm in arm with our brothers and sisters of color and, and help them. Uh, there's a brother, two brothers that um, I'm pretty close to that are African American. And um, we were talking about just how many times they'd been pulled over uh, in the past 10 years that they'd been living here. And, uh, and I told him, I said, okay, if that happens to you again, and if you have to go to court, 
I am going to be right there with you. And, you know, if, if you're, uh, you know, be, being treated unjustly, or if you have been put there unjustly, I'm going to be right there with you and I'm going to stand up with you. And I, I think that's what we really need to, to look at it with our brothers and sisters is that we're arm in arm with each other. And um, those of us that are white need to continue to learn, need to continue to understand justice. But um, man, look in the Old Testament, and especially when God was putting together the Israelite nation, it was all about justice. It was all about um, like the book of Ruth, where um, uh, uh, Ruth is, is uh, uh, gleaning the fields because she was an alien and, um, and uh, oh, I forget his name. But anyway, uh, he, he was, yeah, Boaz, let, let the fields, let the edges of the fields not be harvested. And don't pick up if you if people drop grain, don't pick it up and leave it for the orphan, the widow, widow, and the alien. Uh, because uh, that's that's justice. That's what you're doing to hold up justice. You're helping those that um, for for one reason or another are being mistreated in society or not treated as well. Uh, so justice is the term mishpat is used over 200 times in the Old Testament. Uh, justice is important to God. And I don't see how anybody could be a Christian. And you certainly, from the Hebrew text, you can't call yourself righteous or sadeka if you're not upholding justice. Mm. Yeah, you, you've given us a Bible study. Uh, I think there's definitely a lot uh, of meat right there. Um, I, de I know I definitely will be studying that out. I think for me, the biggest takeaway I have from that real quick is, you know, again, we can't just say I'm righteous individually without having some type of way that we're helping those in need, you know, mm -hmm. who are going in, you know, living out, living in, in, living in unjust situations. So yeah. it, it's, it's very powerful. Um, you know, um, Atoma, just to just to add, a great New Testament scripture is toward the end of Matthew 25, where he talks about the sheep and the goats, mm -hmm. and that um, the goats are the ones that didn't feed me when I was naked or when I was hungry and didn't clothe me when I was naked and and didn't visit me in jail. It's it's part. It's basically saying you thought you were doing well, but you weren't providing justice. Mm -hmm. And so you're not going to be part of me. And, you know, I think that's a very real lesson for all of us. If we call ourselves Christians, are we living and are we practicing justice in our life? Because mm -hmm. it's a salvation issue, I believe. Yeah. One thing I'll say as we continue is I've heard the term, obviously, racist, which that's the same, we know that. But there's also anti-racism, which is someone who isn't fighting against racism, <laughs> who isn't fighting against injustice. So we can't just say, oh, I'm not this. But what we should be doing is we should be doing this or have a certain type of heart. And I thought that was very powerful. Uh, just wrapping this up real quick, uh, Dave, you mentioned also that your son has been doing some great things. And what I wanted to emphasize in this episode is yes, Hope Worldwide collectively is doing great things, but also we can do individuals, in the, each of us as individuals can do great things. And you shared about your son, which I think was a very uh, inspiring lesson. Can you kind of reiterate that? Sure, my son is 31. Um, he lives with my wife and I. Uh, he was involved in a motorcycle accident when he was 20 and suffered a traumatic brain injury and was, um, uh, he couldn't walk and he couldn't talk. He was in a coma for about six months and he's pretty much had to, he's had to relearn everything. And he, so he, you know, he walks with a, um, 
uncomfortably, but is able to and um, has very little short-term memory uh, and a number of other things. But um, he works at a Chick-fil-A and he cleans tables. Um, he's a very social guy and um, he's, he was a Christian before his accident. Uh, he probably has three or four quiet times a day. Um, he's always in the moment, which is, I learned so much from, you know, uh, and, uh, and people love him at Chick-fil-A. Well, with the close down of the stores, uh, he's, he's not been able to work there, so, but he, he wanted to do something. And so my wife suggested this to the manager and he was all in. And so, um, Scott will take home two to 300 of the Chick-fil-A bags because they're still doing a, a drive through business. And he writes encouraging scriptures. He writes encouraging thoughts on the bags. And then he turns them in and then he gets a few hundred more bags and he'll do that in the evenings. Um, and he's probably, uh, I don't know, five, six, 7,000 bags he's done so far. And it's so cool because uh, every once in a while, we'll get a call from one of the disciples saying, hey, I got a Scott bag today. <laughs> That's um, awesome. But you know, there's just, if we really think about it, there's so much we could do yeah. um, of our time, you know, mm -hmm. and, and take the time, like making the masks and making the face shields and, um, you know, delivering, just some food on porches for people, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just so many things we could do, but, um, I think it's a, I love to just see him at the table, you know, scribbling his, the scriptures. That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, speaking of, uh, individual, uh, changes that we can do, I think you're on, are you on mute, Daniel? Uh, we just wanted to switch over to Daniel and if you can share Daniel, just some of the things that you guys are working on. I know you recently just crossed over making 22,000 uh, masks, uh, sorry, mm -hmm. face shields. If Thank you can you. share about how that came about and so forth. Absolutely, yeah. So we were, you know, helpless as most of us uh, felt during the pandemic when it first started the quarantines. Uh, we, we all wanted to serve, but we didn't know how to do it. So we started off with teaming up with uh, it's like a Meals on Wheels local company that does it throughout Southern Arizona and helping them deliver. And that was great. We, we delivered quite a bit of meals, but we felt that there was a greater problem. You know, we, we saw what was happening in all of our hospitals. We saw, um, you know, it was a very unsure time. <laughs> and uh, the more we started talking to the the community about what the needs were it just it came down to PPE um, we knew that uh, things would only get worse uh, without our medical professionals first responders having what they needed to you know combat this uh, um, this, this virus and mm -hmm. so we, we started making the masks that was um, very exciting and we had tons of our volunteers doing it right from their homes uh, making the, the medical masks and we did I think we did a few hundred um, and then we ran into a doctor who said, hey, these are amazing, these are great. However, in these medical facilities, we, we need face shields to accompany these masks. You know, the, these masks only cover 50% of the particles coming in, coupled with a face shield, we're, we're reaching, you know, towards those N95 levels. So, you know, we jumped on it. I, I, luckily, I found a, an article about a hospital network up in Washington. That was when they were the hotspot, the first one in the country to uh, run out of PPE and they got some doctors and engineers together and you know through their own ingenuity created a face shield that can be made um, with stuff they could find right in their town. So uh, you know I contacted some friends and got in connection with uh, that hospital network you know God willing and they without even a question because <laughs> they were actually wanting to try to sell them uh, and they just gave it to us for free. You know, I told them we wanted to make them and donate them here locally. And they just gave us the designs, gave us measurements, the materials. It was uh, material of what we would need to buy and just a huge blessing. And, you know, we got those designs. We had to tweak it a little bit, find out how we can do it and make it better. And uh, really, we're 22,000 shields in and we're still changing things, still 
trying to find better ways to do it. And uh, it's just been a real encouraging. But that's how it started, was uh, just just an idea, just uh, God sending a message of what what was needed. Mm -hmm. So what's been the uh, response from the hospitals or medical community or first responders that have received the mask? Oh, it's been a, <laughs> everyone's different. Some of them can't even talk. Um, there, there was a nursing home that it was actually the first one in the city that was hit real hard. And I think now they're up to, I don't even know. Last I checked, it was like 60 deaths. But uh, when we gave it to them, they were, they, they literally, the, the lady that came out was speechless. <laughs> she, she, she didn't even, she walked right back in and I was like, oh, okay. Are you going to get the face shields? <laughs> And uh, somebody else had to come out. She was like, she couldn't even speak. Um, you're the first person, you're the first group to come out and, you know, really show your appreciation. And uh, they, they were just speechless. There's other ones that are crying immediately. Um, there's even been a, a group of doctors that, that came out and just really wanted to thank our group, um, saying how uh, appreciative they are of all these things that the community's doing and you know especially with the face shields just protecting their lives they feel they felt that support um from the community from you know our brothers and sisters around you know even the country the world that are just teaming up in these uh, very scary times to show that appreciation and love mm -hmm. now what i love about your story is that you started with something which was this thing like uh kind of like meals meals for those in need uh, partnering with an organization and I was like, eh, we probably need to see what the deeper need is from there. And you move to the, 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 ma the masks and then you heard something different. And so you listen to the, the need and then you came up with the face shield. Uh, and, and I think that's just a great example, you know, for us, all of us is, you know, just get started, you know, is you have the heart to keep uh, listening to those that have the needs, you'll find, you know, God will direct you to oh, yeah. what will work. Not only that, just how mm -hmm. things work out that you're able to get like the exact, you know, the, the uh, schematic that would be needed for free because you, because oh, you have yeah. the heart to search. And, you know, mm -hmm. I think it's just an amazing story, you know, that you stated. If you can just cover it, I know you covered this briefly, but if you can maybe just go mm -hmm. through the steps that you kind of went through from, like okay you got you found the company in in uh, well, i think you said washington or so mm -hmm. and you had i'm sure that was individuals but can you share a little bit about that process how that worked others may want to uh, replicate that in their cities absolutely so i think uh first of all if anybody wants to replicate this um you know this this is a this was a mission clear and the more i go into it the more you'll see this was a, a mission from god from, uh, you know, he wanted us to live Jesus-like lives um, through this. So anybody wants the designs for, for face masks or these face shields, we have them. Don't, no need to waste your own time reinventing the wheel. You know, uh, I'll send them to whoever needs them. I believe I might have sent them to Dave already, but um, it's all, it's all to, anybody's. I'll try to put the information in the show notes. Beautiful. See, there we yeah. go. Click on those, click on that information down there. Uh, so with that, uh, the designs are, are there already. The hardest part for us was trying to source the material, especially when we were on lockdown. And even now it's still very difficult to find uh, the materials that's needed. So we had to switch so many times. Um, literally, this has been a worldwide effort. We had to you know, contact friends of friends of friends to source this material from China. Some, sometimes some of it's from the Ukraine. Oh, I could show you here. So it's a real simple design. And, okay. uh, just consists of this vinyl. It's uh, the shield part. Yeah. And we have a strip of foam and then okay. this elastic and then just four staples. And then this tape that holds the foam to the vinyl. Got it. Um, it's clear, you can't really see. But uh, just those five materials were, and they still are extremely hard to find because uh, other companies are trying to use them for other PPE or um, other areas. And uh, literally across the world are, is where we're getting it from now. This went from a hundred dollar initiative to it's blown up to about a two hundred thousand dollar initiative from shipping to purchasing to um, of course providing for the volunteers that are coming in three hours a day, five days a week. I mean it's just four or five days a week. Just so encouraging to see all that uh, mm -hmm. come together. But once you have the materials and, and the design, it's just putting it together. 
real simple. And, um, you know, one of the things was the, the tape to put the foam to the shield is actually the most expensive part of the entire shield. It actually okay. costs half of the shield. And I, I knew nobody that could help us out with pricing. And uh, I called a distributor of, the, of that tape and it was the only place I couldn't get a discount. And I, I happened to get straight through to the CEO of that company. <laughs> he happened to be helping on the phones that day. And he loved our cause, told him we're part of Hope Worldwide, what we're doing. And he said, oh, I'll ship as much tape as you need immediately. We'll give you 15% <laughs> off. <laughs> and just blessing after blessing after blessing awesome. to bring this all together. So very encouraging. That is awesome. So I just wanted to open it up to both of you, if you could maybe share a few words just in reference to, again, some people are probably at home still trying to figure out, you know, where to go uh, as far as next steps, things they can do to be active and try to contribute as disciples want to do. Uh, what would be some words of encouragement you can offer them as in, you know, a person can make a difference, this kind of a thing. What, what are some words you could offer to them? I'll let you go first, Dave. <laughs> okay. Um, I think letting the, you know, if you're a Christian, letting the Holy Spirit prompt you to, to do something. Sometimes we have to just uh, not try to keep on doing stuff, but just listen for a while and mm -hmm. um, try to think. Uh, I think that's what I think a number of us did when, when COVID started is just, okay, we can't use volunteers. Does that mean we don't, does that mean we really can't respond? You know, well, no. Um, so anyway, and I think just uh, asking God to help you see what you could do individually. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you, you know, if you can't make uh, 10 or 15,000 face shields or masks, you can make a few. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you could encourage, you know, uh, uh, whether it be rest, you know, um, acute care homes or homes for the elderly or hospitals, just, you know, I, I was able to sew five masks last week and just wanted to bring them and give them to you. You know, it's, it's not the matter of volume. It's just, what are you doing personally to help in some way? Mm -hmm. awesome awesome uh, daniel what are your thoughts yeah i think that's great too you know uh, listening listening i think that's the most important part of, of service you know whether it's pandemic or not is just listening to the need you know it's a it's really easy for us to jump in and say oh th this is what you need or you know this this is what um, we can do for you instead of just you know listening seeing what 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 is actually um needed in our communities mm -hmm. and um, i think that's the greatest way we can serve make the best use of our resources um, and even in this time you know we, we were actually technically illegal on, on a federal standpoint it was when there was only no groups larger than 10 people allowed and um, we got clearance through our mayor through our congressmen uh, to be able to do it we got a huge twenty thousand foot facility donated to us um, so we could social distance, everyone's six feet apart. I mean, you know, if you put in the time to listen to the least of God's, of Jesus' people, uh, God will make the way. And, you know, just, but we have to take the risk and we have to make that journey. Well, thanks so much, uh, both of you, for your time. I think uh, it's, it's so cool to, to learn about what your church is, our church is doing on a bigger picture but also to bring it home and say, okay, this is what I can do as an individual. And I think you've both shown that in just incredible ways. And even if it's, you know, writing on, on uh, bags, as I think you said your Scott son is doing to encourage people uh, with scripture, which how can you go wrong with encouraging people with scripture? Uh, wherever we're at, we can definitely do something. So uh, thanks so much for your time. Let's uh, definitely have an awesome day. And to everyone watching, let's figure out how we can, like uh, was mentioned, Dave mentioned, to really just, you know, be calm, listen to what God is saying to us, make sure that we're listening to the people around us and hearing what they're saying, as Daniel had mentioned, and then trying to do something with our lives. That's what we're all about. Thanks so much for your time. Have a great rest of the day. Yeah.